Good morning. Please come in. Sir Robert Walpole, Britain's first Prime Minister, moved into Number 10 Downing Street just 250 years ago, on the 22nd of September, 1735. Now he's being moved back again by Mrs Thatcher to take his rightful place in the entrance hall. He and all his successors are on the great staircase of Number 10. Walpole at the bottom is Number 1. In due course, Mrs. Thatcher will join this gallery of ex-Prime Ministers as number 49. George II, now life-size in the state dining room, gave number 10 to Walpole as his first minister. The king had only a shaky command of English, and his first minister, his prime minister, presided at his cabinets in his stead. But technically, the job of Prime Minister didn't exist, so Walpole accepted it in his other role as First Lord of the Treasury. And it is as First Lords of the Treasury that Prime Ministers have lived there to this day. Although it's a top tourist attraction, Downing Street's by no means easy to find. It's wedged between the imperial grandeur of the Foreign Office and the Privy Council Office. Just before Walpole's day, an advertisement appeared for four large and well-built houses fit for persons of honour and quality. It was a bit of cheap jack speculation by Sir George Downing, a treacherous turncoat who ran them up out of the blood money he had made by selling his Cromwellian friends to Charles II after the Restoration. Actually, the house he built in Downing Street was really very ordinary. What was very grand indeed was the house at the back of it, the red brick house looking over the fashionable parade of the horse guards that had once been the Hanoverian Embassy. Now these two houses were knocked together. At the front, a very ordinary London side street. At the back, a magnificent stately home. Walpole and his family lived there for seven years, and he made the taxpayer foot the enormous bill for having it magnificently done up. The taxpayer paid again in the 1970s, when the state rooms were restored to Walpole's style. Chancellors of the Exchequer sometimes took over number 10 from Prime Ministers. One of them was Sir Francis Dashwood, an extraordinary Satanist and rake hell, whose cronies of the Hellfire Club met at number 10, dressed as monks for their debauched rituals. In the blue drawing room is the desk of William Pitt, one of the few memories that remain of the great men who have lived here the port-swilling, unhappy bachelor who first went to live at number 10 when he was 23 years old. Wellington, as Prime Minister, condescended to move into number 10. He rode out from there to fight a duel, and he rode back magnificently unscathed. For 30 years in the mid-1800s, the staterooms were still used for grand parties, but no one actually lived there. Disraeli opened it up again as a house and haggled with the government over spending £150 on a bathroom with hot and cold water. But it was not until the 20th century that every Prime Minister was expected to live in Number 10, and getting there became the pinnacle of political achievement. The wealthy Herbert Asquith presided over Number 10 for nine years. He had astonished society by marrying as his second wife, the eccentric Margot who brought the glamour of sophisticated London life into this rather drab house. And the place was full of children. Her son, Anthony, they always called him Puff, became the famous film director. And Margot's young half-sister kept a sharp eye on what was going on. When I was quite young, I can remember going to number 10 to stay there with Puff 
and being taken through uh, the front door, which was uh, being picketed by suffragettes by my nanny and led into number 10. And then we did a very naughty thing, which was when we got into the nursery, which was on the third floor, looking over number 10, <coughs> Puff and I took a large teddy bear and threw it over the window onto the suffragettes below. <laughs> Margot made the state drawing room fashionably cluttered. The house was very much lived in as a family house, and they entertained privately, informally, intensively. Uh, Margot Asquith was a slightly bizarre social figure, but a notable one, certainly. And Asquith very much liked him, not, not necessarily very grand, fashionable, but not grand social life was what he liked. Margot used to come in and would make us all go round and shake hands with all these grand people, which was extremely alarming. I can remember now being very alarmed at the idea, because I really was only about seven or eight years old. It was run very much like a fairly well-to-do, obviously, family house in, um, in London. Though I remember Margot commenting that it was an awful address. No taxi driver had any idea where it was. Ten Downing Street was totally unknown and the end of Downing Street had disappeared in a fire. Next onto the stage of number 10 whirled one of its most dynamic actors, David Lloyd George. He took over in the middle of the First World War, and with him he brought an earnest young man as his secretary, who was the national shorthand and typing speed champion, and who incidentally one day was also to be the world's oldest ballroom dancing champion. He's now 95. I was uh, ushered into the cabinet room and I saw that huge table, it's a massive oval table, and there I sat with, with, with the cabinet ministers ar ar around me and I took shorthand notes. It was the first time that any shorthand writer had ever been in that cabinet room to take a cabinet discussion. And then I typed it out on my typewriter. Now it became a Welsh-speaking house, both in the kitchen with the servants from Cricketh and North Wales, and for the family who spoke Welsh to keep their secrets and to exclude from their private circle the increasingly intrusive figure who sat here in the office outside the cabinet room, Frances Stevenson. She'd been a tutor to the daughters, Megan and Alwyn, but she'd become increasingly involved in both Lloyd George's political and his private life. Like her? Mm. Oh no, I didn't like her at all. She was very sweet and very lovely, and, and uh, always terribly nice. And she was hard as nails. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but she was very grasping. And, uh, she did some very, very un unkind things for for the fam to the family. But we ignored her completely. Years, years afterwards, years afterwards, she said that for thirty years she had been his mistress. She played her part brilliantly. The relationship was only known to a very few. It never got out. For instance, he would never go out with her alone in a car. When he went out, if we died out, I went out as, 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 as his gooseberry. Lloyd George took an afternoon off from the endless war cabinet meetings to go to his daughter Alwyn's wedding. Wartime economies meant a cardboard wedding cake at the number 10 reception. In due course, grandchildren appeared. One Saturday morning, I walked into the cabinet room to see LG, and there I saw a wonderful picture. LG stood with his back to the big fireplace, and there, running and dancing, ran the cat top of the, of the highly polished cabinet table were two little girls, two of his grandchildren, and they would enjoy themselves to the full. <laughs> and LG was, oh, he was encouraging them. He was laughing his head off and full of joy <laughs> and, and, and verve. Dame Margaret Lloyd George and the ladies working with her on wartime charities had tea parties in the garden that had almost disappeared under a mass of temporary huts, Lloyd George's garden suburb. The purpose was to enable LG to carry out his own foreign policy because it, the, the foreign office was too slow. 
Barricades came for the first time to Downing Street after the war to guard against the threat of Irish terrorists. Lloyd George managed a sort of peace in Ireland, but by 1922, the wartime hero was out of number 10. Two years later, a dramatic change in the lifestyle of number 10, with Britain's first Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. First of all, my old friend, uh, Mr Philip Snowden, who is the Chancellor. Mr Henderson. I don't think people can appreciate now, really, the situation. Uh, here were socialists coming in. A lot of people thought the country would be wrecked. Uh, they were watching for mistakes, both politically and socially. Uh, our move into Number 10 Downing Street uh, was a tremendous challenge. There were a lot of problems. Uh, we hadn't, for instance, got the equipment for Number 10. Uh, we hadn't got a lot of money, uh, but we were helped a lot by friends. And the Ministry of Works uh, stepped in and helped a bit. And my sister used to go to the second-hand uh, places and buy very nice second-hand things to equip number 10. MacDonald was a widower, and his eldest daughter, Ishbel, was only 20 when she took over as his hostess. For the first time, number 10 had a tenant who couldn't bring a whole staff of trained servants with him, but some old friends from Scotland came down to help them. I mean, I used to practice my golf chip shots uh, up that very long corridor to the cabinet room. Uh, there was that atmosphere in the place, very nice. My father was a tremendous walker, and indeed every day before breakfast, he and I used to walk round St James's Park. Uh, we used to walk with John Buchan, Keynes, all kinds of people used to come and walk with us. And MacDonald needed all the advice he could get from Keynes or from anybody else to face the financial crisis that in 1931 swamped his second Labour government. A street that is usually deserted, Downing Street is crowded at this hour of national crisis. What is going on behind these famous doors? The whole country and the rest of the world is watching to see how Great Britain is going to put its financial affairs in order. The Prime Minister leaves for an audience with His Majesty the King, who has hurriedly returned from Balmoral. Mr. MacDonald has just said that the, uh, everything is going as well as it possibly can. Downing Street was in turmoil, and Sheila MacDonald had already started packing her bags to leave. But when her father returned from the palace, it was as Prime Minister of a national government and he lived on there for another four years. He had survived, but as for so many who moved into this house in high hope, he was to leave it in deep sadness. When the time came for him to retire, I think he was really very glad. He'd never really been happy in the national government, and also he had been a sick man for several years indeed. He should not have stayed on so long, really. I think there were two things he never recovered from in all his life. One was the death of my mother and the other was the break with the Labour Party. Sharing the stage of number 10 with Ramsay MacDonald during the 20s and the 30s was Stanley Baldwin. The tenant was once again a wealthy man of property. He'd been an amiable paternalistic employer at the family's Welsh steel mills and he happily played the young master to his men at Downing Street. They asked if they could all come up and see Master Stanley as he was before he took over, you see, from his father. And they came up, including one little boy with that entrancing face with a cap on. And they all came to Downing Street just to see him. And he let them all in, saw them in the garden, spoke to them all. Baldwin's pipe-smoking affability brought him back to number 10 three times. Mrs Baldwin was a great party giver. She had style. She never walked anywhere, said her daughter, except in Harrods. This is Mother's private sitting room. All these are official carpets and paintings, obviously, because we had no ancestors, I can assure you. And this was the breakfast room. Father always had breakfast there, and his great friends used to come and have breakfast with him. This was his private library, and nobody went in there without permission. And he could shut himself away if he wanted to. And there he had to face the massive constitutional crisis of the abdication of Edward VIII, who used to slip in secretly through the garden gate at number 10 to see his prime minister. The king had said to him, when the thing really blew up, he said, Mr. Baldwin, this is entirely between you and me. I will have no interference from anybody. 
so far they had to shoulder the whole, whole burden. But it nearly killed him because he f was fond of him. Do you see what I mean? He was torn, literally. And he was just absolutely f finished. The old house had seen yet another career end in disillusion. Neville Chamberlain's time in Downing Street ended too in disillusion, but it had its temporary triumph when after flying to bargain with Hitler to try to keep the world at peace, the nation thought he was returning to Downing Street with peace in our time. When he came back again, it was until VE Day, I've never known anything like it. The relief of, of the general public was such that um, it didn't have barriers in those days, as you know. Uh, Whitehall was full of people, Downing Street was full of people. And at the entrance to Downing Street, crowds waited for what might be called the climax to act one of this great drama. Mr. Chamberlain had returned to tell the cabinet what had passed between him and the cure. The young Lord Dunglass, the future Lord Hume, who was one day to live in number 10, had flown back with him. When we got there, there were masses of crowds in the streets outside, of course. Uh, and uh, inside was packed with the staircase, like sardines. And as they moved up, I heard somebody say, I was about a few paces behind Chamberlain, I heard somebody say, I couldn't identify him. Neville, go up to the uh, uh, window and repeat the historic uh, uh, statement, peace with honor. He turned rather snappily on whoever it was and said, I don't do that kind of thing. Now, that was the authentic Chamberlain. He didn't do that kind of thing. He wasn't a flamboyant man at all. What he was going to do was to go up to the window and wave to the crowd and, and, and just that. But somebody in between uh, the, the person I heard talk to him and the window must have persuaded him and said, oh, go on, get it done. And he did. And he knew it, of course. And he knew it was a mistake and it was a fatal political mistake. I, I've always felt that when he said uh, at peace in our time, um, I, I would never know if he believed it or not, and I think the only person who would have known whether he believed it was Mrs Chamberlain, because they were very close. The Chamberlains kept up the number 10 tradition of daily walks in St James Park. War, though, was now inevitable. Prime Minister drive to the Commons. The House assembles for a fateful last debate before Britain declares war not on the German people, but on the leaders of the Nazi regime. He was always very uh, calm uh, and cool. And um, I think in his original broadcast, for example, when, the, uh, when he declared war, I was in the private sector's room. Uh, we were listening in. But I think that was very well done. Uh, and uh, the kind of message that uh, the, the people felt they wanted to hear. To withdraw their troops from Poland a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. There was an air raid alarm and we all um, went down and I had grey flannel trousers and a shirt on the thing. The lady, uh, Mrs Chamberlain had on a dressing gown and Everybody was pretty dishevelled, except for Lord Hankey, the Secretary of the Cabinet, who suddenly came in at 3.30 a.m., dressed in a bowler hat and a uh, black pinstripe pin suit. So that returned us to normal. The crowds who once again filled Downing Street now saw Chamberlain as a weaker appeaser, and they wanted a stronger man to fight the war. Goodbye, Mr Chamberlain, and thanks for all you've tried to do. We welcome the new Prime Minister, Mr Churchill. Churchill was the 41st Prime Minister since Walpole moved into number 10, and his dominating presence is there still. Certainly he was the most engaging and demanding of them all. As one of the young members of his staff recalls, it was a 24 hours a day commitment. He liked to have a private secretary with him uh, in his bedroom, in case he had any uh, special thoughts about the morrow. Uh, but you stood there while he got... Uh, mother naked and uh, he always uh, he had a fine I think it was ivory handle long handle hairbrush with which he sort of had almost a ritual scratch uh, on that unscratchable bit and then uh, he, he put on this little uh, really mini vest a little 
silken vest, which was barely adequate. And that is what he slept in. Sheila Minto was a secretary at number 10 for over 30 years, coping with the egos of eight prime ministers, from Stanley Baldwin to Harold Wilson. This is my gallery of prime ministers, and I always call it my rogues gallery. <laughs> Churchill was one of those rogues. It was one evening, I suppose about five. I went down to do something, I can't remember what, and there, sitting outside the cabinet room, this side of the cabinet room, and they're not in the private office, um, was this girl looking like death, you see. And I said to her, what is it? She said, I can't, I can't go in, I can't go in, he terrifies me. So at that moment, one of the private secretaries flew out of the office, I don't remember which one, and, and said, for God's sake, Sheila, you go in, and snatched book out of Dorothy's hand and I went in and there he was sitting you know one side of the cabinet table and you were expected to sit the other side with the typewriter and he said who are you um, so I, I told him so he grunted and uh, I produced my shorthand book and he said no, 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 straight on straight on I thought oh lord you know straight on. So anyhow, he did, he dictated straight on and then just reached out and snatched the paper out of the typewriter. So he got some jolly queer typing and I thought, oh, well, that's an experience. My goodness me, that's an experience. But what I didn't expect was the next day he asked for me again. Sometimes in the afternoons um, he would want to dictate and he would be in bed by then, ready for his evening sleep. He used to call out to uh, Mrs. Churchill, as she was then, darling, these U-boat figures are very interesting. I'll get Miss Minto to bring them into you. Bombs were devastating London, and sandbags were piled up round Downing Street itself. The Churchill's youngest daughter, Mary, serving in the ATS, spent her leave at home. Number 10 is quite a, a rickety house, or was in those days. I expect it's all been underpinned and stiffened up now. But I remember quite well, before the bombs fell, you could hear the number 11 buses thundering down Whitehall, and the house used to shake. The garden rooms on the ground floor were shored up against bomb damage. Mrs Churchill turned one of them into a basic but comfortable dining room. And here the king came 14 times to dine with his prime minister. Churchill insisted that work should go on at number 10. I was in the private secretary's room and uh, in the mirror I saw the most extraordinary apparition coming down the stairs. It was the rotund figure of the prime minister in his enormous quilted Chinese dressing gown with great red and golden dragons writhing around it. Slung over his uh, shoulder was the uh, regulation knapsack carrying the regulation gas mask and his tin hat on his head uh, uh, trundling down the stairs. And he came within sight of the uh, mirror and I, I saw him in the mirror. He started and a broad grin spread over his face and he came in and he said, John, conditions of total war do produce some most remarkable spectacles. Number 10 organised its own air raid proportions and the head air raid warden was the young John Peck. He roamed the house with his bucket of sand on the lookout for trouble. In a disused bedroom, I found uh, an incendiary bomb, well alight and going well under the mattress of a, of a bed. Uh, it had come in diagonally through a, a, a thin wall in the interior courtyard. So I just shoveled the thing with my little uh, shovel into my bucket of sand and carted it out, and that was that. But I secretly regarded myself as the man who saved number 10 on that occasion. Churchill himself saved the staff at number 10, and one evening during dinner in the reinforced dining room, a bomb fell very close indeed. And he went through to the kitchen and found wonderful dear Mrs. Landmore uh, just about to put a pop of souffle into the oven. There she was working with her kitchen maid with all this noise going on. And my father 
um, ordered her and the kitchen maid and the pantry staff to go through to the air raid shelter. And in fact, he saved their lives because a few minutes later, another bomb fell much nearer and the whole of the huge kitchen window crashed in and a lot of the ceiling came down. And I think dear Mrs. Blantamore would have been obliterated. Anyhow, she always said that my father saved her life. Number 10 was, in fact, extensively damaged during the war, but the Churchills spent much of their time in the bomb-proof annex at Storey's Gate nearby. All the windows of Number 10 were blown out, although wartime censorship kept these demoralising pictures away from the public. Churchill still used the Cabinet Room as his office whenever he could, and there he prepared his great wartime speeches with his long-suffering staff. One of the troubles was that the PM would go broody, for about three or four days, uh, compiling the thing in his brain. And we get more and more worried, wondering when on earth he was going to produce this thing with a parliamentary deadline coming up. And then, <clears throat> usually after dinner one evening, uh, uh, he'd ring the bell and uh, uh, with a broad grin say, I shall need two women tonight. About ten, he liked to start dictating. Until what time? Roughly three o'clock. Two to three. You must have been exhausted. Well, you'd think so. I've managed to live till 76, so I suppose. <laughs> Hard work doesn't really kill you. The most momentous speech of all, of course, was the victory broadcast from the Cabinet Room. Today is victory in Europe Day. Tomorrow will also be victory in Europe Day. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause. Yet even Churchill knew, like so many others, the bitterness of defeat at Number 10. Two months after victory in Europe, the first election for ten years swept him out of office. He moved out to Claridge's. And now an extraordinary change of personalities with Clement Attlee, a retiring and unpretentious man. The Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready for a new policy to face new world conditions. The gardens of Downing Street were filled with the new intake of Labour MPs who were invited over to tea, but he was a private man who kept his family life carefully separate. Well, it wasn't an exuberant atmosphere. It wasn't an atmosphere redolent of cigars and champagne and brandy, which the Churchill atmosphere was, or, an, or of the, the constant oratory, oratory around the dining room table, oratory around the cabinet table, which was, um, which was Churchill's habit. It was the Atlas who, on Churchill's advice, had the private flat where Prime Ministers still live carved out of the old servants' quarters in the attics of Number 10. It took three months to get the work done. Attlee loved the place and quickly settled down there in great family contentment with his wife, they had been married for 23 years, and their four children. Roy Jenkins visited them as a family friend. My father was a great friend of Attlee's, and therefore I had a certain family connection as a young man. They used to give dances, I remember, not all that often, but they used to be sort of evening dances for the children to which we were invited. And they were very enjoyable, except I was always a very bad dancer. But it was very like, it was, it was very like a party might have been in a quite large house in the home counties, belonging to a con solicitor, perhaps, of Probably a rather conservative outlook, you would think, but who liked having this sort of um, occasion, very much a family occasion, um, um, for his children. And that, I mean, that was a remarkable aspect of Attlee's life. He probably achieved more radical change than any other Prime Minister, but in his personal habits, they were very conservative habits. Clem, you know, only ever read The Times and The Observer on Sunday. He never read anything else. But his new press secretary thought he ought to have a ticker tape. And so he asked him, Clem said, no, he saw no reason for a ticker tape for the news. He read it in the Times every day. Why did you want a ticker tape during the preceding day? So they went away foiled. But then somebody in the press office had a very good idea. The next day, his press officer went back to Clem and said, um, Prime Minister, do you know there's a new machine out? Oh, said Clem. Yes, he said, it tells you the cricket scores every half hour. Oh, what a splendid idea, said Clem. Perhaps we'd better have it. And over after that, the ticker tape machine was known as the cricket machine for Clem and his cricket scores. <laughs> this quiet, laconic, kindly man lived in number 10 for six years.
But Churchill, now 76, came back to number 10 as though it was his rightful place and settled down in the cabinet room like a homing pigeon. Lady Churchill was not enthusiastic about the return and about her husband's insistence that they should live in the large state rooms instead of the small flat upstairs to cope with the demands of entertaining during the coronation celebrations. But she gave in and returned the white drawing room to its traditional role over the centuries as the boudoir of the Prime Minister's wife. Then another wedding at number 10. This is Jan Heal reporting from Downing Street on the romance of the year. Mr. and Mrs. Churchill are on their way to the wedding of Anthony Eden and the Premier's niece, Clarissa Spencer Churchill. And here's the bride. Eden had tried to keep the wedding secret. Even Lady Churchill, the bride's aunt, had had to rush back from holiday to be there. And then I spent the night before my wedding there, as far as I can remember, entirely alone in the house. I think somebody must have brought me a tray for my supper, but I remember feeling incredibly lonely. We had this marvellous reception and we all went into the garden and the photographs were taken and that was that. By 1955, it was time for the great man finally to leave number 10. And then the last party at Downing Street was when the Queen and Prince Philip came to dine the night before my father was you to offer her his resignation. My father made the most charming speech without a note, and I remember it was delightful. A um, few tears I shed behind my napkin. He talked of the wise and kindly way of life of which your majesty is the gleaming champion. Rather nice way of putting it. And then presently the Queen and Prince Philip took their uh, leave and my parents went down to the doorstep of number 10 to see them off. And there was the most charming photograph, which the Queen afterwards sent my father, of her, he is holding the door of the car for her and saying goodbye to her. And she has the most charming expression on her face, almost like a daughter looking at a father. He hated resigning, and he knew that this must be for the last time. Churchill was now an old man of 80. When Eden duly followed him at 57, he seemed to have about him the stamp of guaranteed success. For many people, he was for years the Beau Brummel of British politics, but he has long been recognized as a man of courageous principle. Now the door of number 10 opens to him, only the seventh Prime Minister of Britain in nearly 40 years. The first day at tea time, um, in those days, uh, civil servants paid for their own tea. We had a tea club. I understand that they now give it, get it on the state, but anyway. Um, and uh, so we had a tea club with the private secretaries, which we just started with a new group. And um, the Prime Minister came in rather diffidently through the cabinet room door, you see, and said, uh, could I join your tea club? So we all said, um, yes, Prime Minister, but uh, have a cup of tea. And he then explained what had happened. He'd rung the bell for the messenger and said, could he have a cup of tea? To which the messenger had said, oh, you can't have that, sir, but uh, I dare say the private secretary would let you join their tea club if you asked them, <laughs> which he then did. He was a handsome, handsome creature. <laughs> he really was. He, he used to dictate in bed, rather like Winston except he looked more glamorous. He used to wear gorgeous pyjamas. <laughs> Winston's were always rather homespun. <laughs> nice, but homespun. Anyway, he used to... Uh... But he gave it up after a bit. You know, I think he got a bit bored with it. Well, I thought it was the nicest house in London. Not uh, so much um, the downing side, which is the side which the public normally sees, but the back, which had been the Hanoverian embassy before. Was, was one of the nicest houses you could possibly wish to live in in London. Lovely what? rooms, terrific view over the Horse Guards and St James's Park. But in spite of its charm, Number 10 was often lonely for Clarissa Eden. Wives were expected to know their place. In, in my day, uh, the wife wasn't considered this tremendous asset, which she nowadays is. And a great many of the dinners for famous and interesting people 
took place, they were all male dinners in which, um, you know, all male working discussions were taking place. And the most fateful of those dinners was the one given to the young King Faisal of Iraq in the state dining room on the 26th of July, 1956. During the dinner, a telegram was brought to Eden telling him that NASA had seized the Suez Canal. Eden was furious and number 10 was immediately plunged into a state of crisis. It was very tense and also it was, it was never ending. I mean, it went on all through the night. Uh, private secretaries were rushing in and out of the bedroom with papers and, and, and um, the meals, I mean, were three hours late regularly. And people were added. There wasn't enough, you know, partridge to go around or something like that. That happened once. Philip de Zulueta told me he couldn't, he had nothing to eat because he, he saw that there wasn't going to be enough food. So he just had to refuse everything. <laughs> so he went around. <laughs> The, the crisis was so acute that I don't think that uh, I actually thought about myself at all. Uh, I mean, all my energies were devoted into trying to make everything as, as easy as possible for Antony, particularly because, as you know, um, his health was getting worse and worse all through the crisis. Eden, as opposed to Macmillan or Chamberlain, Eden, re Eden really did live on his nerves. Uh, and so that, uh, there's no, that his nervous state was conveyed to almost everybody else. And so that was a, a time of great nervous, uh, nervous tension. The Foreign Minister Selwyn Lloyd leaves Downing Street after a dramatic ten-minute meeting. Behind him is Housing Minister Duncan Sands. They have just learned from Sir Anthony of the doctor's verdict, which has left him no alternative but to go to Buckingham Palace and lay his resignation before the Queen. Number 10 had once again seen a gilded career end in the dross of bitter disappointment. Harold Macmillan suavely moved in to calm the nerves of the nation and of Number 10. And the press are waiting for the new Premier outside the door of Number 11 Downing Street, his residence as Chancellor. His first words, there will be no general election, and when there is, we shall win it. His family watch from above as Mr Macmillan deals with the journalists. He enters number 11, the house he must now leave for the shortest but most significant move of his whole career. Uh, it, was, it was a different um, atmosphere because Harold was very good, Harold Macmillan was extremely good at um, calming everybody down because naturally it had been a very frenetic time and I think he thought we'd all got rather um, overworked up and he uh, calmed us all down very, very well. That was a famous occasion, you know, I think you've been told, when he put up on the, on, on the door that quotation, um, quiet, calm deliberation disentangles every knot, to which my great friend John Wyndham added, and remember, if it doesn't, you will certainly be shot. And he was uh, uh, marvelously um, entertaining always. You did your business, but uh, it, was, it was great fun at the same time. It really was a, a lovely period. Why? I think the... Uh, the friendliness, perhaps. And he, of course, was, um, he was so good. I and mean, he still is. One, one felt proud of him. And the world's greatest statesmen were proud to visit him in number 10. Well, Mr. President, in the 17 years of our friendship, which I think started in North Africa, we've had many frank talks together. And I think we can have a frank talk this evening. We've had good talks at Chequers, and here we are at number 10. Well, Harold, let me tell you right away and tell to all of those good people out there who've been so kind to me and to my party that we are mighty glad to be back visiting again this lovely country. And of course, in number 10, Lady Dorothy was marvelous. She fed us all hours the night and morning. It was really a family party. Dorothy was the most marvelous gardener. She was, she was tremendously keen on her flowers. And, there are all sorts of stories about her gardening in her petticoat. She had a miner's lamp which she attached to her forehead, you see, so that she could, she could garden when it was getting dark. But George Downing's number 10 was by now quite literally falling down. Staff had to be stationed at doorways in the state rooms to keep guests moving in case the rotten beams collapsed beneath them. Years of expensive tinkering had been useless and something had to be done. Number 10 was taken apart. The Macmillans moved out and the builders moved in. They were there for three years, twice as long as anyone had planned for, and the cost was £3 million, 
twice as much as the original estimate. There were 14 strikes, an obvious hazard at such a publicity-attracting site, a cause, some say, of the dry rot that reappeared within a decade. Number 10, number 11 and number 12 were virtually rebuilt. Less than half the old structure remained. By 1963, the Macmillans could move back into Warpole's old house. But they'd been back for only a year when Mr. Macmillan resigned through ill health. And an unassuming figure moved, much to his own surprise, across the road from the Foreign Office. Lord Hume accepted Her Majesty's invitation. He was now on his way to Number 10 as Prime Minister an office few people until recently ever thought would be his. In the Tory party, no choice would have been unanimously approved. But perhaps when the tumult subsides, Lord Hume will be a popular premier. He addressed himself now to the task of choosing his cabinet. What was your feeling going back there as Prime Minister to number 10, that special address? Well, astonishment that I was there at all. <laughs> it never occurred to me I'd be Prime Minister, you see, because I, I was very comfortable in the Foreign Office until I was jerked out of it by um, Harold Macmillan being ill and therefore jockeyed into this uh, exposed position in number 10. I was never told he was going to be <laughs> Prime Minister. I heard it on the radio. <laughs> I was sitting in, in uh, Carlton Gardens, perhaps, yes, and uh, I knew there was a lot going on. He, he'd gone off to the Foreign Office in the morning. And luckily my son was with me, because I think I'd have fainted. And they suddenly a flash came on and said, Lord Hume has gone to the palace. And I remember saying to David, God, in that suit. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and nobody let me know about it. And they did, the Foreign Office simply didn't have time. To... Um, I liked working in the um, drawing room at the end of the state rooms, the smaller rooms. You could shut off, look down to St. James's Park and, uh, and on to um, uh, the horse guards had the advantage of diverting you from your red box every now and again. Did you have droves of servants to look after? None. <laughs> On the private side, absolutely exactly none. There was no really as such a private dining room. Well, there was, but uh, it couldn't be used because it was a sort of passageway. So when he was having a male luncheon party, I couldn't have anybody really. I had a sort of tray upstairs. It wasn't very well. Well organised. Did you have a sense of history when you moved in as the Prime Minister, uh, walking oh, through yeah. that door and so on? Mm. It's all round you. And of course, I'd, uh, I'd known most of the Prime Ministers uh, from Lloyd George onwards, too. So, uh, um, one told a, a, a lot about it. So it was, yes, it was a stepping into a fairly familiar scene. You then eventually stepped out after not, what, less than a year, wasn't mm. it? Yeah. Well, when you say step out, one goes <laughs> out the back door. A bit undignified. Awful. Fred. I suppose so, but it would be much worse to, to, to be going back to and fro while your successors were coming past you out the front door. I think but other countries have right. a leader of the opposition's house, which is sort of... I mean, anywhere else does, as far as I remember. Yes, Howard do. Wilson said we could go to check us. Well, that was quite a good thing, but otherwise we'd be on the street. Yeah, that was kind of it. Because although we didn't think for sure we'd win that election. One couldn't go around looking for a flat. Well, a, there wasn't time, and B, it looked rather pessimistic. And then the Conservative Party put us in a hotel for a fortnight, which was very helpful. The man the Hume so tactfully made way for, Harold Wilson, had already got as far as the doorstep when he had come to London for a day out as an eight years old Yorkshire lad in 1924. Well, the Empire exhibition was going on all that year in Wembley, and uh, my father took me down in his um, motorbike and sidecar, WR 8183 from Yorkshire, and uh, we went to the exhibition, then we went on a tour, and I stood outside number 10. I don't think they'd let you do it now, of course. And my father took this, uh, this picture, and, and that is the picture. There's a great big flat cap that we used to wear in those days, not a little cap. Wilson, the man, went through the door of number 10 in October 1964. 
Well, I must say it was it was quite formidable at the beginning, and one of the first things that happened was that we had a Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference, which was very exciting. I always found that that one of the most exciting things that happened. But on the particular occasion when we gave the big dinner, we had the big dinner for about 65 people in the big dining room, and then we had about 300 people coming in after dinner to meet the Prime Ministers. But there was some sort of crisis over at the House of Commons, so immediately after dinner, my husband and all the ministers present rushed across to the House, leaving me to entertain 300 guests coming up the stairs uh, in their absence, and this was one of the first things that I had to do at number 10. It was the swinging 60s, the Wilson era, which opened up number 10 to headline-catching guests. And so we um, used to have a lot of people who would be known, not only known to the readers of newspapers, but people particularly on the entertainment side. We had the Beatles, of course, well, they were, they were almost constituents of mine. There had been, I'm quite sure, for a very long time before, a feeling that uh, artists, uh, entertainers, singers were not really the sort of people you asked to number 10. And, and we, we just sort of moved uh, the country forward a few years. Then came the biggest headline catcher of all, Richard Nixon. He, he went around with a whole crowd of motorbike outriders and you could hear them coming along Whitehall. And I remember he was, he was coming in and uh, so I opened a window and looked out to see the motorbikes coming and then his car drive out because he was coming to see my husband on that occasion. It wasn't for a banquet. And I remember I got a letter saying, how could I behave like that, leaning out of the window and looking at people? It wasn't at all the way for the Prime Minister's wife to behave. It was a time when Number 10 became involved in dramatic, cliff-hanging solutions to threaten strikes, thrashed out over beer and sandwiches. But when the railwaymen came, Mr Wilson discovered they hadn't eaten all day. And, uh, well, I, I can't think of anybody in this country who would have refused to try and get some food for them. But we're not in number 10, I mean, <laughs> uh, available in that sense. And there were a lot of them. So uh, I arranged for members of my staff to go along to the Chancellor of the Exchequer's house and open up his kitchen. Wasn't there an occasion when they came through and stole our bread, your <laughs> local bread? <laughs> That's true, yes. I don't know if perhaps Mrs Wilson told you this, how there was a great um, discussion late at night. About, I think it was the railway strike was on and uh, the beer and sandwiches were running out and we helped to fill the gap. <laughs> well, well, not quite. They didn't even ask you. They came through and they went into the kitchen and they took your loaves of bread. And uh, we didn't know till afterwards, till the next day. <laughs> well, At least that's my story. <laughs> now, don't spoil it. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> silent. <laughs> you know, it's always regarded as one of the tests of a government whether the door between number 10 and number 11 is kept open or not. If relationships are bad, it's always locked, so we're told. However, it's always open in my time. Incidentally, while we were there, there was a, a little man who, I believe, lived in a hostel round the corner and used to come every morning and pray. And he brought this rug, this little mat, and he used to unroll it solemnly and kneel down and, and tell his beads and pray for the Prime Minister and the nation every morning regularly at 9 o'clock. Then came the man who, more than any other modern Prime Minister, has left his mark on number 10. The first occasion I went to number 10 was when Mr Churchill became Prime Minister in 1951. I remember very well looking round and seeing the portraits of Pitt and Fox, of uh, Wellington and Nelson. And I said to myself, if I ever do come uh, to be Prime Minister, then those pictures are going. They're just copies. They're not the real thing. And later on, having visited so many places in the capitals of Europe and elsewhere, seeing the beautiful treasures which they got there, I became more and more convinced that number 10 ought to be representative of English culture. It is a splendid house. It obviously has a great tradition. On the other hand, uh, I thought it was dowdy, seedy, and... Uh, really needed doing up properly. My hand was very really forced in a way because when I got there, they said, well, we must tell you at once that the great white room, the pillared room which you entertain, has got dry rot. Uh, they said that Mr. Wilson had refused to have anything done about it at a time when he knew he was likely to have an election. 
So I had no alternative. And this gave me a tremendous opportunity of completely redecorating and refurnishing number 10. In the state dining room, there was a splendid new table. The oak panelling was lightened, and friends lent some fine British paintings. The first major dinner party we had after it was all completed, I did invite Harold Wilson and his wife. I remember that in the pillared room after dinner, uh, I, over coffee, I did say to her, I hope you like what has been done. And she said, no, not at all. And if we come back here, the first thing we'll do is get rid of these pictures. And they did. Music came to number 10 with Mr. Heath. We had a great deal of music at number 10, as well as at Checkers. Some of it was uh, after dinner. We did establish tradition that grace before and after dinner was always sung. Uh, one of the most remarkable musical evenings, I suppose, was a dinner I gave in honor of William Wharton's 70th birthday. And uh, there, friend and foe were united. You know, musicians very often don't like each other very much. And at midnight, I said, uh, well, I once heard William Walton in a radio broadcast ask if there was any work in the world which he would like to have written. And without pausing a moment, he said, yes, Schubert's B-flat trio. And I said, now, to celebrate the birthday, we have Schubert's B-flat trio. But the music stopped after the Who Governs the Country election of March 1974, and the Wilsons moved back. In 1974, when we returned to number 10, all the staff were lined up in the hall and in the corridor that leads through to the cabinet room to applaud. It was a very moving moment. And uh, it was a, a moment almost a treasure. It lasted for about 30 seconds when one of the policemen said to me, you know, this is the same lot that were applauding Ted Heath when he went out earlier in the day. In fact, the Wilsons decided to break tradition and use number 10 only for official purposes and not to live there. Late at night, it's, it tended to be a bit lonely when the building emptied because you have to remember that there are over 100 rooms in number 10 and an enormous crowd of people actually worked there. So when they'd all gone home at night and it went very quiet, then it, it was a little bit lonely looking out across um, the horse guards parade. A bit spooky. It was, yes it was. One could feel possibly the ghosts of previous prime ministers. There was also a pink lady who was supposed to haunt um, uh, the number 10. I didn't see it, but my, my husband saw her once. What, uh, who was she, do you know? I don't know who she was. Nobody ever found out. She just appeared. There was a, 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 one of the people who, who cleaned the flat suddenly saw her one morning just standing there in this pink dress, and there was a sort of cold feeling along the corridor, so I believe, although I never saw her. But did Harold Wilson like living there? I liked the job. I think if, uh, let's, let's suppose it had been blitzed in the war, I think it would have been rebuilt in rather different circumstances. But yes, I did like the whole sense of history there. To feel, to remember some of the names of the people who've been there. And if this problem did look really difficult, compare what they had to do with their problem and so on, even, wor even more difficult. I don't think Anyone has a chance of doing well as a prime minister if they haven't got a profound sense of history. I may be wrong about that. In 1975, Mr. Wilson added a little history himself when he suddenly retired at the age of 60. He was able to go out of number 10 from the front door, one of the very few prime ministers of modern times to leave there in good health and of his own free will. The succession in the Labour Party was obvious. After years at the cabinet table, what were Mr. Callaghan's feelings when he was in number 10 as the boss of number 10? I think they were pretty, uh, pretty tremendous. Uh, it was uh, something that, uh, that by that time I didn't expect to do. Um, I had expected to finish as foreign secretary and it was a bonus to become prime minister. In 
his long career, Mr. Callaghan had known the splendours and the drawbacks of several official residences, so he was not especially impressed by moving into Number 10. Well, in fact, you were very reluctant for me to come to Number 10 at all, as I remember. And I had really to quite a battle to make you... Now, you work. kept this wrong. It wasn't me <laughs> reluctant for you to go. It was me reluctant for me to go. I was very happy where I was. <laughs> <laughs> Every Prime Minister likes to feel his cabinet has its own style. Mr Callaghan's was relaxed. Uh, we had a little private secretary's room next door and they used to be able to tell what the cabinet meeting had been like by the degree of laughter that emerged from it. I used to on the hoe to try and keep them laughing and we had some very, some quite jolly cabinets. Um, believe it or not, Shirley Williams used to sit next to Tony Benn. Tony used to be quite funny, I knew. Frightfully amusing, you know, he can be on, on these occasions. Because people think of him as an ogre. Shirley's got a very quick, good humour. And we had quite a lot of fun in those cabinets. In 1977, Mr Callaghan made Number 10, once again the centre of world politics, when he invited leaders to a summit meeting. President Giscard of France, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, Prime Minister Andriossi of Italy, Chancellor Schmidt of Germany and President Carter. They were each given their own office inside Number 10. President Carter's was the room normally used by the Prime Minister's ecclesiastical advisor. Um, and on the second day or third day, one of the private secretaries came out and said to my private secretary, tell me, sir, what is that map on the uh, wall of President Carter's room? We, we've been through it, and we know it's not the American air bases, and we know it's not any part of your defence installation. Tell us, what do those flags that are on the map mean? Yes, said Ken, I can tell you. They mark the bishoprics of England. <laughs> no house has seen men raised higher in triumph or brought lower in defeat. Yet those who would follow them are waiting, undeterred and eager, in the wings. I didn't enjoy living there very much. I don't think I enjoyed the living part of it nearly as much as Audrey did. What I felt was different um, when I stood in that cabinet room or stood beside the Prime Minister's chair with the picture of Sir Robert Walpole up behind. I genuinely felt that I was a trustee for the past uh, as well as a custodian for the present. Uh, and there was a great sense of um, British history in all its phases, even though many prime ministers didn't live there, as you know very well. Nevertheless, some great scenes of British history have been enacted in that cabinet room, and unless you were entirely deficient in a sense of history, uh, it was um, rather tremendous to feel part of that moving pageant, which I trust will go on for another 250 years yet. Now then, 